slim contemporary novel, no. A slim volume of poetry, no. A not so contemporary slim volume, no. A play, no. A long book that somehow does not reach 800 pages, no. An even longer book that feels like it goes on forever that still somehow doesn't make it 800 pages, no. Hey guys, so I thought that uh, with March of the Mammoths, uh, less than a week away, I want to say, uh, I would do uh, a recommendations video. I did say that um, I might do a recommendations video, and I thought I just would um, for anyone who's interested. Um, uh, you know, if you like some of the books I talk about, you might consider reading them. Um, perhaps not for this year for March of the Mammoths. I, I guess I think most people would ha will have their uh, choices picked out by now, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, so if you like them, then then feel free to to read them. Um, but uh, it's also just a chance for me to talk about some long books that I've really liked. I'm going to talk about two, and then I'm going to talk about the two books that I am going to be reading for March of the Mammoths. Um, so I will get right to the recommendations. Um, the first is uh, Les Mortes d'Artour by Sir Thomas Mallory. Um, this inter this sort of goes in tandem with uh, Jason's recommendation in his video, um, where he recommended The Mists of Avalon by Marion Zimmer Bradley, which is a novel that I love. Um, and which is a reimagining of the Arthurian myths from the perspectives of all the female characters. And it's a very sort of feminist, um, uh, very sort of feminist reworking of the myth where, uh, the male characters are mostly side characters and the women play the prominent roles. Um, but this is the source material for, uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley. Um, and also actually the epigraph to the myths of Avalon comes from Les Mortes d'Artour. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, and, you know, obviously this being a, probably the most influential collection of Arthurian legends uh, would obviously influence a book that is a reworking of the Arthurian myths. Um, but it, it stands as a, as a great work of literature on its own. Um, it's just a, it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful epic experience. It's, uh, Thomas Mallory was weaving together a lot of disparate traditions uh, regarding the Knights of the Round Table. There were a lot of different uh, writers, uh, producing works about the Arthurian legends. Uh, it was one of the most popular subject matters for writers in the Middle Ages. Um, and he wanted to try to weave all the different stories that had come, come up around Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and Merlin and, and, uh, the, the quest for the Holy Grail and Mordred. And he wanted to, uh, weave them all together into a single huge work. And this is, uh, this I think is just about exactly 800 pages, um, I believe, yeah, it's like 800, 804 pages, there we go. Um, so it does, uh, reach the page limit of 800, or the page minimum of 800 pages, um, just barely. And, uh, yeah, this can be a weird book at times, I mean, there are a lot of just random instances and ra anecdotes that don't seem to have really any bearing on the wider story. Um, you know, uh, Thomas Malley will just randomly tell an anecdote about how, you know, uh, Gawain was in the countryside and just came across this random other knight that he felt the need to have a duel with, and they had a duel, and, um, and Gawain won, and so the, the other knight sort of submitted to him, and they just sort of were both glad with that, and they just sort of went on their ways, and you never saw that other knight ever again. Um, there are a lot of weird things like that, and that makes parts of this difficult to get through just because it can be hard to see why different parts of it are exactly relevant to the overall story. Um, but getting through parts like that are totally worth it for me um, because this is, this can be such a moving story and I think a really profound story too. Um, and um, yeah, I mean just timeless. I mean considering the number of times this has been adapted, I think it would be great to just go back and read some of the primary source material and um, yeah. Uh, and the writing, the writing in my opinion is just beautiful, it's written in a very sort of, it's not, it's not like Chaucerian English, but it is like, it is older English, um, the, the diction can be a little bit stiff and archaic, um, but for me that is one of its qualities, I really like that, I find it really charming. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, just Les Mortes d'Artour, I love this book, it's one of my favorite books, and, um, yeah, anyway, uh, so you might consider it for March of the Mammoths, or for whenever you're in the mood for a long book. Um, and the second book I want to recommend is one that I can more easily just say that 
pretty much anyone can read it and will probably love it. Um, and it's uh, Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. Um, this I've talked about a few times. It's uh, It takes place in the 1800s after the Mexican-American War. And um, Woodrow Call and Gus McRae, um, who are just called Call and Gus, uh, are two sort of old former Texas Rangers. Um, they're sort of in their 50s and 60s now and sort of just... Um, their glory days are over of being Texas Rangers. They spent a lot of years um, fighting Native Americans in Texas. Um, and now have just sort of settled into a sort of complacent life as sort of ranchers, farmers, whatevers, bums, I guess. I don't know, they don't do much. Uh, Gus just sort of um, half-heartedly does a little bit of work on Call's farm and then drinks himself to sleep every night. Um, and then Call sort of just works himself to sleep every day. Um, and then uh, the sort of driving force for this story is that uh, an old friend of theirs comes back uh, from sort of a self-imposed exile in um, who knows where. We don't really know where. He's just been off in, in Arkansas and many other places in the country, and he suddenly returns uh, to them. He's he's also a former Texas Ranger, and he gives Call the idea to uh, gather up a bunch of cattle and lead it up to Montana and become the first white people to uh, start a ranch in Montana. And so these this group of people, there's many other characters. Um, there's a, a prostitute named Lorena who uh, comes with them up north to Montana. Um, we run into a former love interest of, of uh, Gus's. Um, we get flashback scenes of a former love interest of Call, um, and there's a young boy, a teenage boy, whose name I'm not remembering at the moment, who who is um, has been living with Gus and Call his whole life, uh, who goes with them, and yeah, it's just it's just a weaving of a bunch of different stories all together on this one cattle trail up to Montana, and it's just it's just a beautiful story, um, you know. I I don't particularly care if my protagonists in novels are likable. In fact, most of my favorite protagonists are decidedly unlikable. Uh, but it is it was refreshing to come to a novel where a lot of the protagonists, not all of them, a lot of them, are, are actually quite likable. Um, and, and they aren't smart, uh, always, which is what makes them compelling and interesting. Um, but they are likable, and I, I did care about them. And, um, and yeah, this book has really stuck with me, and, uh, you know, I really look forward to the day when I finally buckle down and reread it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's great. Um, it won the Pulitzer Prize, so it has, you know, prize endorsement, but it doesn't really need it, uh, because it sort of speaks for itself. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Lonesome Dove, that's my second recommendation. And then on to the books that I'm, I'm going to be reading. So one of these books I am going to read, another one I'm going to sort of, um, I'm going to probably read the second one, but I'm not going to, I'm going to try to keep myself from putting pressure on myself to read it absolutely. So I may or may not get to it, but this first one I absolutely will read, and it's a book that has been on my bucket list for a long time. And it is the Mahabharata, a modern retelling by Karol Satyamurti. Um, so the Mahabharata uh, is an old epic poem out of ancient India. It was uh, written down in the between the 9th and 5th centuries BC, um, it, the, the original author of it is unknown. It was probably uh, it was probably composed orally, and then it was probably composed orally by many different people um, before it was ever written down. Um, but it is as old or older than the Iliad and the Odyssey, and it is uh, more than twice as long as uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey combined uh, in its original Sanskrit form. It was originally written in Sanskrit. This is um, a translation into English, and, uh, I think pretty much every translation that's been done has been heavily abridged, uh, because it is so long, you know, the original Sanskrit would run to, like, a several large volumes, um, and I, you know, I actually don't read Sanskrit, so I have to go with an abridgment, um, but the Bhagavad, or sorry, the Mahabharata tells the story of the, of a civil war in ancient India, um, between the Pandava and Ka Kaurava princes, sorry, I'm, I'm reading off of, uh, for names, for, off of my phone for names, um, and it tells of this civil war, and, um, and, uh, and just the twists and turns that happen in this civil war, and the, the real centerpiece of, uh, of the Mahabharata is, uh, one particular section called the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is a long, uh, conversation 
between uh, one of the princes of one of the houses in this dynastic conflict uh, and uh, the god Krishna, who is the embodiment of Brahman, who is the supreme godhead of, of many different religions, but in particular Hinduism. Um, and uh, this just for this forms the philosophical foundation for um, a lot of different religions, but of primarily Hinduism. Um, but along with that, there are wars, obviously, there's a romance in here, there's all sorts of things that I'm hoping to experience for the first time. Um, this book has been on my bucket list for, I, I think, like five years now. Um, so I was just really excited to finally get to it. And um, I have heard good things about this translation. Uh, it has blurbs everywhere, but it's also published by W.W. W. Norton, who are a really good publisher who I've heard a lot of great things about. And something that I also like about this tra particular translation is that it is in verse. Uh, whereas a the Penguin Classic uh, translation of the Mahabharata is in prose, and I prefer when epic poems are you know translated into verse because they were originally written in verse. Um, and yeah, so this clocks in at let's see what's the magic number, eight hundred and sixty three pages, uh, including the afterword. Um, and there's also an introduction, but that that isn't counted into the page count of this book because it's in the the you know, Roman numeral count that they do the introductions in. So, yeah, 863 pages, so it easily it easily beats the uh, the mar benchmark for Ma March of the Mammoth. And, um, yeah, so this is the one that I absolutely am going to read. I'm really looking forward to it. I love these old epics because they just tell such grand stories, but with, you know, a deep human, you know, a deep human el element to them, just like, you know, the Iliad. Um, and then the second book that I am going to be hopefully reading is... Uh, the Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. And um, yeah, this is a, a 14th century, basically collection of short stories and novellas that Giovanni Boccaccio wrote. Um, it does have sort of a frame story where the three young men and seven young women sort of um, are living in, a, in, I believe, Florence in Italy. Um, I think it's in Florence. Um, are living in Florence, and uh, the plague is ravaging the town, um, so they decide to just sort of leave town and go to this country sanctuary and decide to entertain each other by telling each other stories, and that, that is what the Decameron is, it's just these stories that they tell each other, and they're just really funny and bawdy and naughty. Um, I actually read a couple of them last year, I was going to read it last year, but uh, just got sort of swamped with other reading projects. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so it just, it, the four stories in here are great fun. They're about, you know, uh, you know, husbands cheating on their wives, wives cheating on their husbands, uh, men and women getting swindled, monks doing bad things with women, uh, and um, yeah, just, just body tales of everyday people um, that I think will be great fun. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, and you can take the Decameron and the Mahabharata as recommendations as well. Um, I, you know, I, they have stood the test of time, uh, they are huge classics, obviously, so, um, yeah, anyway, those are my, uh, recommendations and my two TBR for March of the Mammoth. Um, I'm, I might do another video just when the March of the Mammoth begins, um, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, yeah, so that, uh, that is all, and, uh, I'll see you all in my next video. Bye, guys.